You're watching This Week in Space with Miles O'Brien. Brought to you by Binary Space. Reliable space systems. Hello and welcome. This week we have everything from NASA creating vomit in a lab to fire and smoke. And let's cut right to those flames you want to see first. Three, two, one, fire. That fire and smoke blasted out of the most powerful solid rocket motor designed for flight, a five-segment solid rocket booster, unlike the Space Shuttle's four. This was a NASA and ATK test in Promontory, Utah. It was a $75 million test of a rocket that President Obama once canceled. This five-segment motor was built to power the Ares-1 rocket. This one blasted out a 600-foot-long flame that was 5,600 degrees and can generate up to 3.6 million pounds of thrust. We love an excuse to show catchy video anytime here at TWIST, and NASA just gave us two good reasons. The agency selected two companies for experimental space vehicle test flights, Arbadillo Aerospace and Mastin Space Systems. They awarded them a total of about half a million dollars. Those awards will be used by the two companies to test their systems near the edge of space. That's considered to be the area between 65,000 and 350,000 feet. The awards will fund two flights this fall and one this winter of Armadillo's Super Mod vehicle from Spaceport America in New Mexico. The first two flights will be to an altitude of approximately 9 miles and the third to approximately 25 miles. A Mastin Space Systems vehicle will make four flights this winter from the Mojave Spaceport in California. Two flights will reach an altitude of approximately 3 miles and two others will be going to approximately 18 miles. All good things must come to an end, and that was the case Monday for NASA's ICESat spacecraft, which fell to Earth in a controlled reentry over the Barents Sea. The spacecraft weighed about a ton, and NASA expected about 200 pounds of debris to survive the fiery plunge to the surface. Launched back in 2003, ICESat was an Earth-observing satellite designed to measure the thickness of both land and sea ice, as well as vegetation, clouds, and atmospheric aerosols. Its laser instrument stopped working last year, and controllers fired onboard thrusters over the summer to adjust its orbit and bring it down in a safe and controlled fashion. And here's a cool twist. NASA farmed out the planning work on the final maneuvers to students at the University of Colorado Boulder. It was a great project for them, and it saved some tax dollars, too. ISAT-2 is on the books to launch in 2015. As long as we're deorbiting things, Tuesday was trash day up on the International Space Station. In space, it's a little more complicated than pushing the big green bin out to the curb. As you know, the station gets regular shipments of supplies via unmanned Russian progress vehicles. Well, once the station crew members unpack all the cargo, they start packing trash back in, and when it's full, the progress undocks, and Russian ground controllers eventually deorbit it, and it burns up over the Pacific Ocean. The station crew waved bye-bye to Progress 38 in time to start preps for the arrival of Progress 39, which is set to launch from Kazakhstan on September 8th and dock at the station two days later. Also on the ISS, astronauts were keeping an eye on Hurricane Earl from 218 miles up. Talk about a bird's eye view. And one more piece of station news before we move on, NASA crew assignments for Expedition 34 and 35. The headline, in March 2013, Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield will assume command of the ISS, making him the first Canadian commander. Way to go, Chris, eh? The NASA family bid farewell this week to astronaut Bill Lenore, who died at age 71 of head injuries sustained in a bicycle accident. Lenore was a scientist astronaut selected in 1967, and he waited a full 15 years to make his one and only flight. In the shuttle program, he's a man of many firsts. He flew on the first operational shuttle mission, STS-5. The previous four were considered test flights. He and Joseph Allen were the first mission specialist to fly on the shuttle. He was the first flight engineer to assist the commander and pilot during launch on the flight deck. He switched seats with Allen for the return home, and so he was the first astronaut to ride back to Earth on the mid-deck. He and his crewmates deployed the first commercial shuttle payloads into orbit, two communication satellites. And he and Allen were supposed to conduct the first spacewalks from the shuttle but space sickness and suit malfunction scuttled that plan. Lenore went on to serve three years as associate administrator for spaceflight. Check out this super cool visualization of the solar system that shows the location of asteroids over time as we Earthlings discovered them. 
Here's what our situational awareness was like in the year 1980. But let's skip ahead a bit. Discoveries really took off around the year 2000 or so. The ones in red are so-called Earth-crossing asteroids. Need to keep a particularly close eye on those. It's like Yogi Berra said, you can see a lot just by observing. Another interesting asteroid tidbit this week, there's been a lot of buzz in recent months about a possible manned mission to an asteroid, perhaps sometime in the 2020s. Well, opportunities to do that may not be as plentiful as you might think. We can't go to just any old asteroid. We would need to choose one that's got to be zipping through space at the right speed, spinning just right, viewable by ground-based telescopes, and reachable using a heavy lift rocket that has to be built between now and then. And when you put all of that up on the scale, do you know how many suitable asteroid candidates there are for a manned mission in the 2020s? According to the NASA Near Earth Object Office, two. Of course, we may discover others, which would be great. It's nice to always have options. Here's a new view of a mysterious Martian crater, complements of the European Space Agency's Mars Express spacecraft. It's called Orcus Patera, and scientists are not sure how it formed. A leading theory, it's an impact crater from a small object that hit at a shallow angle. From Mars to Mercury, NASA's Messenger spacecraft has been executing flybys of our solar system's innermost planet for the past couple of years and is preparing to pull into orbit around Mercury next March for a year-long science mission. Here's a Messenger image looking back at Earth snapped about three months ago during its closest approach to the Sun. Check out the Moon. Is that cool or what? If you want to keep on top of missions like Messenger, NASA has a new iPad app out called NASA App HD, free at the App Store. Among other new features, you can stream NASA TV live and view images like the one we just showed you from Messenger in high resolution. Also, NASA has started putting more of its image archives up on Flickr. You'll find a lot of new imagery up there, but also a fair amount of historical material too. Point your browser to our website for a link. That's spaceflightnow.com slash twist. Here's a story that really stinks. No, really, NASA is creating vomit in a lab. Really? So why does the space program need vomit? Well, here's what researchers told roving reporter and astronaut Mike Massimino. This is the space program. Why do we need vomit? Go ahead, Mickey. So what we're doing uh, next month is we're doing a test on a trash bag. Mm -hmm. And we need to put all the trash that you might have on a space mission in that trash bag. So that includes mm -hmm. potentially vomit, as well as diapers filled with urine and fecal matter, as well as food trash. Mike. It smells like... Right. So may I? Go for it. Laugh. <laughs> yeah, okay, I think you got it. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> so uh, bottle that stuff. <laughs> Would you like to? <laughs> yeah. I think you probably I think you probably smell it at home. Take a whiff. <laughs> Another breakthrough for our nation's space uh, program right here. We can mix vomit. Mix vomit. There is a vomit recipe from medical research that NASA based their formula on. Yeah, really, there are recipes for that. Manufactured vomit kind of makes me want to, well, you know. If you want to see more of NASA's vomit research, and come on, you know you do, head to our page, spaceflightnow.com slash twist. Oh, yeah, and don't forget to uh, upchuck a couple bucks at our PayPal link if you want to keep us on here. It's time for us to wrap this up. I'm feeling a little sick myself, actually. Don't need any odorama scratch and sniffs to go along with that story. Well, thanks very much for watching this week. And if you like us, please, as we said, consider tossing us a few bucks on that PayPal link. Just head to spaceflightnow.com slash twist. There's four of us keeping this show on the air. We want to keep it going. You can send us an email, twist at spaceflightnow.com. Tweet us at This Week in Space. Check out the blog at milesobrien.com. Thanks so much to our sponsor, Binary Space, for helping us pay the bills that keep the cameras rolling. We really appreciate your ongoing support. Join us again next time for all the news off the planet. And remember, last time when I said I'll vacate the hot seat next week for Miles, this time I mean it. We'll see you then.